My guest today is the director of the Immune Tolerance Network, a National Institutes of Health initiative for immune therapies of disease, and founder and former director of the Benaroya Research Institute in Seattle, Washington, USA. He is past president of the Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies and has published over 350 scientific papers on discoveries ranging from basic science to clinical medicine. He also serves as an advisor for many academic and nonprofit organizations involved in biomedical research and received recognition through several awards, including the University of Washington School of Medicine Distinguished Alumni Award. He's also my uncle-in-law, a native Oregonian, a professor at the University of Washington, and a scientist credited with numerous discoveries over decades of work with a career he describes as devoted to change. My guest is Gerald T. Nepom, MD, PhD. He goes by Jerry to just about everyone. I'm Aiden Nepom. You can call me Aiden. And this is The Changed Podcast. Hi, Jerry. Welcome to the Change Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Aiden. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I just, um, I was really excited about this idea because you are a particularly well-respected scientist. And these days, everyone is talking about how important science is. And so I thought, you know what? I'd like to hear from you. Um, And if that's true, I'm sure other folks would as well. I think that's great. I I do think science, of course, is all about change. So it seems like a very appropriate uh, type of topic. And as you said, the news is full of science and change these days. So we'll get to it all, I'm sure, in the next few minutes. And changing science also. Mm -hmm. Um, Which, to my understanding, um, the idea that a scientific discovery would be fixed and permanent for all time goes counter to the scientific method. Am I right about that? Or is that just a thing I think? No, absolutely. Uh, Being a scientist and thinking about science is uh, basically embracing the idea that things are going to change. Uh, You want to advance the field. You build on the, we, you stand on the shoulders of the people who came before you and you build and you build and you learn more. And we learn more about the world around us. We learn more about ourselves. We learn uh, about health. We learn about the environment. Uh, it's all constantly changing. Well, I feel like having someone on the show who is uh, actively involved in research around uh, our global pandemic with COVID-19, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you just to talk a little bit about the work that you're involved in. Would you be willing to share just a piece? Oh, sure. I mean, I've had a long career in science, but the, the my current activity is leading clinical trials in immunologic diseases and disorders. Uh, So I have an organization called the Immune Tolerance Network. And if people are interested in it, you can go to immunetolerance.org and learn all about us. Uh, And we design and we conduct and we analyze clinical trials for a variety of immunologic diseases and disorders, ranging from organ transplantation to uh, deficient immune responses to autoimmune responses to allergy. And we are indeed involved in some of the COVID response clinical trials. And is there, you know, there's a lot of um, chatter, at least in my Facebook feed, from people who don't have a scientific background who are um, sort of clamoring to attach themselves to particular scientific perspectives. So, and then people complain about politicizing science. Um, it seems like there's something that you might be able to offer people in how, how they might choose to think about the science that they're seeing coming out from all different directions and perspectives. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting topic for sure. I mean, the, the science perspective, I think, uh, on the current uh, noise pollution <laughs> surrounding COVID uh, is, is that we are learning as we go. What we thought we knew in March is not the same as what we know now in August, and we, it will not be the same as what we know at the end of the year. Uh, and having the flexibility to realize that things that we are learning more, that our notion of the disease and the way to deal with it evolves, 
is fundamental to, to the whole approach. But the guiding principle for most scientists is that those, uh, that progression of, think, of our thinking needs to be guided by the data. It's not just good enough to have an idea or a concept or, or some way of thinking that isn't supported by actual facts. So using data-driven science to guide that change in thinking is really, really fundamental. And I do encourage people to go with the data rather than uh, the latest trendy ideas. It seems challenging to go with the data. Um, you know, not the general public doesn't typically subscribe to scientific journals. So in terms of going with the data, we rely on things that are easy to find and, um, and or things that people are sharing online. How does somebody who's not in the sciences go with the data? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, fortunately, some of the reputable news organizations have done an outstanding job in reporting accurate scientific data. Uh, for example, The Guardian, you know, a British news uh, yes. organization, or Reuters, uh, or The New York Times. Uh, they've, they've really done an outstanding job. It is true that if you want to delve into the core scientific background or even read the uh, public health guidance and the CDC guidelines, it, it can be a little bit messy. But uh, I, I encourage people to find a, one of those reputable sources and uh, you know, go with it. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's a good recommendation. I definitely, uh, I definitely have found the CDC and World Health Organization websites to be extremely confusing in their yeah. messaging. Uh, yeah. Including, including the current, uh, you know, we're recording this conversation in August, and the current conversation around mask wearing seems particularly confusing. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the real disappointments of this whole cycle has been the way that the CDC and the World Health Organization have uh, let us all down. Uh, they really have failed to uh, come up with a very consistent. Uh, way to approach the disease that uh, makes sense. I wonder if that's because the science is rapidly changing, but it requires a lot of vetting before they put a message out into the public. No, I think it's all politicization. It, it, mm. It's all politics. Yeah, the, the, the core credible scientific base uh, really hasn't, uh, hasn't been con that confused. <laughs> Oh, that's good to know. So the Guardian, Reuters, and New York Times have been doing the best job reporting from your perspective. I will for the, for keep the, that For in the mind. general public, I think that's true. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, taking things out into sort of a more broad and personal um, lens, how do you, Jerry Nepom, generally feel about change, this sort of big concept that means everything from changing socks to changing your worldview? Well, the way I think about it is uh, as a scientist, and I think of it as something that you need to really embrace. You need to you make it uh, very much a part of who you are and how you see the world. Uh, try to understand it and then grow with it. Uh, to, to me, uh, being a scientist, it means that you do really em embrace change as a core principle, uh, not just a goal, not just something to aspire to, but uh, a real core principle, uh, the rationale for being what you do professionally. Uh, and I, I think good scientists have, have a passion for uh, discovering and, and evoking change. I mean, that's why you go into the business. Um, it, you know, it doesn't have to be discovery-based science. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you can change the way people think. You can change the knowledge that people have. Uh, you can change some of the practical stuff that um, you, know, you where you apply science to, to daily life or future life. There's lots of, of ways that scientists can change the world, uh, but I think the the overall concept is to be a a, a real a successful and and uh, good scientist. You should embrace it and make it part of well, you know, what you aspire to. Are there particular things that you do that help you feel that way? Well, when I, when I talk to students and fellows of, about becoming a scientist, I always tell them it's important to ask a big question. And what I, what I mean by that is, 
big with a capital B. You know, you, you really do want to ask something that isn't known and make sure that if you get, the, get an answer, no matter what the answer is, it's going to make a difference. And so the question has to be a big question. You know, and I think that's a, a good way to approach science. Now, the answers you get may turn out to be more incremental or, or, and not really you know, change the world immediately. Uh, but if you start out uh, asking that kind of big question to make change, I think you're on the right track. I, I will say that the true eureka moments are rare. You know, uh -huh. I, I call them eureka moments because you see some new data or discover something and, oh my gosh, you know, eureka. You know, <laughs> that, that doesn't happen all that often. Uh, but when it does, it's pretty exciting. You know, you realize that just for a moment, you know something that probably nobody else in the world knows. And then you go, you know, open the door and tell everybody in the lab and then, you know, then you tell the world. So it, it, it can be an exciting moment. Uh, but you have to be in this business, you have to be ready for the long haul because that kind of eureka moment does not happen every day or every week or every, even every year. So I think my first uh, eureka moment was probably uh, when I uh, came across and figured out the uh, major genes that uh, control autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Uh, that's quite a while back now, but that uh, was a pretty uh, eye-opening thing for me and helped, uh, helped change the way the field approaches uh, autoimmune uh, disorders. Um, I promise I'm not going to just stay on immunology and science <laughs> the whole time. Well, but why not? <laughs> I, <laughs> um, but I am curious what your thoughts are about... Um, so uh, recently I, I've heard, and again, it feels like rumor and hearsay when I hear of anything in the scientific community um, coming out into the general public. Uh, but recently I heard that one of the approaches to um, developing a, a vaccine to trigger immune response to the current pandemic would be using vaccine technology that's based in gene therapy. Is that true? And if so, do you have thoughts about it? Well, there's different ways of doing that, but some of the uh, some of the vaccines are either based DNA based or RNA based, and some of the DNA based vaccines involve ma making a recombinant vector uh, that is from a known virus uh, that is not generally not harmful uh, to to uh, basically be uh, camouflage itself, uh, make make it look like it's a coronavirus even though it's not. Huh. So the, those are the recombinant uh, technologies that are being used predominantly. You know, the, the term gene therapy can mean a lot of things. Even the current RNA vaccines are given in a way that get inside a cell and then uh, co-opt that cell to make uh, mimics of the virus so that you make an immune response against it. So there's lots and lots of different strategies of using genetic engineering for a better vaccine production for quick, let's, let's call it this way, uh, quicker vaccine production. It sounds very science fiction-y to me, which of course leads me down a path of like, if it was a movie, this would be horrifying that we would even try and change anything at that level in the human body, as opposed to triggering some, I, and the, this is because I don't understand the science at hand, I'm, I'm assuming, but I picture this like science fiction plot, in which everyone becomes you know, mutant people. Well, it's, it's no longer difficult to do. That, that's, that's both good and bad, I suppose. Uh, it, it is a little scary uh, in that sense. But the technology to, to make the RNA and DNA-based vaccines now is really very straightforward. It's why it was possible just within a few weeks of the publication of the first uh, you know, COVID-2, uh, the coronavirus uh, uh, sequence, uh, that some of the companies were able to start the vaccine production just a few weeks later. How well tested is that idea as a vaccine strategy? It hasn't been uh, taken all the way into a, a FDA approved vaccine just yet. This will be the first one. Yeah. So there's, there's definitely risk involved in the whole concept. It's interesting. These technologies were developed after the uh, 
well, initially after the Ebola uh, outbreak a few years ago, and then after the SARS and MERS uh, act, outbreaks uh, also within the last few years, but they were never deployed in the field because those uh, epidemics were brought under control. So it looks like uh, this will be the first uh, serious public health use of those kinds of vaccines. When you think about that, do you get excited? Do you get afraid or do you have neutral feelings? No, there's definitely risk involved in any new vaccine development, but I think the strategy that's used in the United States of having uh, three phases of clinical trials uh, to, to assure safety and assure efficacy in, in a broad patient population, I think that's a, a very good strategy that mitigates the risk and makes it worth the risk to develop the vaccines and deploy them broadly. All right, so coming back out, zooming back out again, would you be willing to share a story from your own life of a moment of pivot? I thought I would tell a story from when I was a, a young scientist. I'm no longer a young scientist. <laughs> that may be obvious. I've been in this business. Uh, my first research lab experience was actually in 1967, so I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, when I was in my young 30s, uh, I was uh, trying to figure out if I would be a good scientist, you know, picking it as a career and deciding well, what did it mean to me, what did it mean for my, uh, my life to become a scientist and, and so forth. So I had just uh, finished my training and I had just set up my own independent laboratory for the very first time, a very small scale type operation as most uh, young uh, scientists are in their young 30s. And I was uh, at that time, studying a, a big question. Even, even then I understood it was important to ask a big question. So I was trying to understand how the genetics of our bodies control our immune system. How does our immune system know what to attack and what to leave alone? And there was already quite a bit of information in the field about how this would occur. Uh, some people had done some quite a bit of work in mice and it was well recognized as a, that there were fundamental genetic elements that, that did exert control over the immune system. And so I was uh, working on this in humans. So I was one of the first people to start doing this in people uh, and had done some experiments with, at that time it was, we would now consider it rudimentary genetics uh, based on the technologies that have changed, of course. Uh, but at the time it was cutting edge. We had developed some very new ways of looking at genes. And I had an insight into how the genes in our body are organized in a way that can address that question. How does the immune system know what to recognize and what to leave alone, you know, what to attack and what to leave alone? So I was, I was working in the lab like this and had a pretty good idea of how things worked. And I read a, um, an article, it was a book chapter, by a very famous immunologist at the time, uh, a French immunologist, where he was tackling the same question. Uh, and he had uh, written a whole book chapter about this, uh, was full of diagrams and everything else. And I read this thing and I realized he's got it all wrong. You know, this is, this is complete uh, nonsense. You know, to me, what this did is it made me realize that uh, even as a young scientist, I could make a difference. You know, I could really help advance the field. Uh, I, I can change the way people think about things, even things that are big questions. Uh, and, you know, I'm not telling this story to diss an old, an, another scientist, you know, an older scientist. <laughs> it was obvious to me at the time why he had made the mistake. You know, he, he was using a, uh, a framework of thinking about uh, genes and about immunology that was based on an older way of that people had done science. And he had, uh, had not embraced the newer technology, the newer ways of, that the, we needed to think about um, what the data was telling us. So it, it, was, it wasn't a, you know, a, a me versus him or a, you know, thinking that I knew more than the world or that I was any smarter than anybody else. It was just the, the recognition that uh, as a, as a young scientist, I could have a perspective and I, and I could make a difference. And that, I think that's uh, something that, I, that has stuck with me even this, this long. 
I mean, basically every decade or so, I have changed uh, what I work on in my career, uh, looking for uh, the opportunities to really bring in the, the newer technology and the newer ways of thinking and advance the field and to tackle new questions. And so even though you know I've been an immunologist for you know, almost 50 years, uh, it's, uh, it's changed a lot in that time and I've tried very hard to to uh, change with it. <clears throat> you know, in a sense, I started out in basic science, like that example I just told you about, mm -hmm. realizing, oh my gosh, you know, I can do this. I can be a scientist, I can make change. Uh, starting out in basic science to where I am now, where I lead these uh, clinical trials. You know, it's uh, been an interesting transition. Thank you for sharing that. I have a question for you, which is, have you, since then, have you had the flip happen where somebody came to you and they were like, I was reading something that you did back in the 70s and it was malarkey. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but, I, you know, if it does, I would actually embrace it. <clears throat> that would that would make me very happy. Uh, but uh, I don't think I can say that that's, that's happened yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wonder, I wonder how long it takes, you know, before some of what you're currently working on becomes the old way people were looking at things. Yeah, yeah, that is a good question. Um, hopefully, you know, what we're doing and the way we uh, present it is in a framework that uh, fits into this paradigm we were talking about earlier, about how you have to uh, plan for progression. You have to build on past knowledge. So I hope that everything I've done in my career and what I'm doing now is part of that foundation upon which other people will build, not necessarily something that they'll blow up and discard and you know do it <laughs> completely differently. Do you think that there's um, that there's wisdom there that other fields could adopt? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I I, I really do think that, uh, especially younger uh, scientists or young people who are considering going into science. Uh, can, can maybe uh, have the similar type of experience, even if it's not literally you know, the same kind of exact thing, uh, by realizing that individuals uh, who, who really do have open minds and can think creatively and can garner the, and use technologies that may have new applications, can make discoveries, can, can figure things out, uh, and then decide, okay, this is, this is good. You know, this can be a career. I can keep doing this. Uh, it doesn't have to be in discovery science. It can be, as I briefly mentioned before, more practical areas too. Uh, if, even if you're not the person who discovers something, you may be a person who can help uh, apply it. Uh, in a, whether we're talking about medicine, where it would be diagnosis or prognosis or therapy, or whether it would be in the environment, you know, helping with uh, mitigating climate change or whether. I mean, there's a million different areas where you can apply this kind of thinking and this kind of scientific advance or just uh, advance in thinking uh, to improve your life, to improve everybody's life. Yeah. It's super interesting to me because I think of the amount of time and money that's and, and manpower that's involved in so much of uh, research on, you know, anything from, as you said, climate science to your field of immunology. Um, and how invested people typically are when they invest so many resources into something. So this idea of um, flexibility and this, you know, the excitement I saw in your face when you're like, it'd be cool if somebody, I mean, the, my version of what you said, but it would be exciting if somebody were to come to you and say, it's, it's malarkey. We found a different uh, thing that completely contradicts that. Um, yeah, yeah, it would be fun. I mean, I, you asked me earlier, uh, sort of what I, to give one example of a eureka moment that I had, and I mentioned some finding these genes that uh, cause susceptibility for diabetes, type one diabetes and arthritis. I remember very much soon after this event I already told you about, I was at my first international scientific conference. I was asked to give a talk on uh, how the genetics control the immune system in type one diabetes. Uh, these other, uh, there was a scientist from Sweden who talked before me about his ideas about it, a scientist from France who talked before me with his ideas about it. And then I got up there and told them what I thought. And uh, th this was right after I had made that discovery. So it was the first time I had 
internationally presented the data. And it was that kind of a thing from their perspective, uh, because mm. as soon as I gave that talk, both of them stood up in the audience, you know, uh, asked a couple of questions, made these very, very uh, generous statements about how this made perfect sense. It explained their data better than what they had presented, and they were mm. thrilled that now the field could move on. And for me, that was really uh, such a positive experience. You know, the, the fact that the more established investigators in the field recognized when there was a new uh, advance and embraced it. And we've, I've been extremely close friends with these guys ever since. Uh, oh, cool. And we've, in fact, we've worked together and we do lots of uh, science things together. So that's the way it really, I think, should be. And when I mentioned about embracing change or making it part of your core principles, not just something you do, uh, you know, having a passion for it, that's kind of what I meant. Uh, it's, I think that's the best part of, uh, of sort of the scientific community. As you said, there's a lot of people and a lot of money and a lot of effort going into uh, various big questions in science. But none of it would advance without individuals, uh, particularly younger individuals, you know, embracing the idea that they can have a new perspective on it or bring some new technology to address the question. I often wonder if the the curious nature of the sciences works in a similar way to the inter internet, where if you can think of a question that should be asked, that somebody's already asking that question. And I don't know if it really works that way or not, but that's like a thing that I think might be true. That like, um, for example, there was a recent article, I think it might've been New York Times that was talking about um, looking into the people who have been asymptomatic with our current um, health crisis, maybe the key to unlocking, you know, potential treatment strategies or whatever. And I thought, man, that was a question that I had in the very beginning. That was like the sure. first thing that occurred to me, but I'm not in the sciences. So, but it yeah. wouldn't occur to me to try and call up a scientist and be like, hey, have you thought of this? Because I assume if I'm thinking of it, someone who's actually in the field is thinking of it. Yeah. I think that's probably true. I mean, certainly that example is a perfect example. Uh, there, there are clearly the asymptomatic carriers who've had a reasonable ex exposure to COVID uh, you know, are telling us something. <laughs> and in fact, there, in fact, there's a great deal of research going on about that right now, taking apart every parameter that people can think of in terms of the immune system and, or in terms of the way the upper airway and the nasal epithelium interacts with the virus when it first enters the body. And there's all kinds, and the genetics behind that. There, there's all kinds of different studies going on right now to try to unlock the answers that that is trying to tell us. Uh, and in fact, there are several uh, therapeutics that have already been uh, introduced into clinical trials that are uh, best guesses, I'll, I'll call them that, uh, about, uh -huh. about the answer to that question. Uh, what is it about people who are asymptomatic that uh, makes them that way? And can we, can we mimic that in terms of a aerosol to spray up the nose to, so that everybody would have that kind of initial resistance uh, to the virus and so forth? So it's a, it's a major concept and a major area and opportunity for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading about a nasal a nasal spray as a possibility that was in trial. So that that's yeah. uh, it's that's interesting that it would sort of work as like a almost like a barrier method without it being a barrier to breathing, simply a barrier for the the virus to take root, so to speak. Yeah, there, right. There's a couple kinds of those uh, sprays that are being tested. One is a spray of a type of an interferon that boosts the initial immune response in the nasal epithelium, the the lining mm -hmm. of the nose. And another is what you were just talking about, which is basically a decoy, so that when the virus get, does get in, it doesn't attach to the human cells, it attaches to the decoy instead. So there's lots of, uh, of ideas about how to do this. And of course, each of these has to go through a little bit of clinical trials to say, is it safe? You, know, mm -hmm. you don't wanna you know, trigger something that we haven't thought about yet. That could be a problem. And then is it effective for everybody? Because Part of the problem with what we're developing right now is that things that are effective in healthy young adults 
uh, may not be effective in the older at-risk populations, for example, or in the very mm -hmm. young. So there has to, has to be significant testing in the right populations before we can roll these things out. Yeah, someone was yeah. pointing out to me recently that a lot of initial um, testing of vaccine strategies, for example, um, typically they ask for healthy volunteers when um, the people who are most vulnerable are, you know, have multiple indicators of, of risk, um, right. that, obesity, a, diabetes, and so on. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Then that, that, that is a concern for the current vaccine developments. You start in healthy people because you're interested primarily in safety issues and you can sure. figure them out quickly there. But ultimately you go through these three phases of clinical trials so that you can test the efficacy and safety in all these populations before you can before the FDA will license it for the general population. So we are going through those stages right now. And that's why it takes time. That's and it takes big numbers. Some of these newer vaccine trials are enrolling up to 30,000 people to get the distribution of various backgrounds and ethnicities and health uh, disparities and health problems, get everybody represented in the population. So that's why it takes a little bit of time. I, I will just mention uh, that this, um, the Immune Tolerance Network, the group that I lead right now, uh, is fundamentally about uh, thinking differently. I mean, that's why I enjoyed your, your vignette here of thinking about the, uh, the people who are uh, not progressing or you know, resistant to COVID and, and coming up with an explanation for that. Yeah. Because the whole idea behind this immune tolerance network that I, uh, that I direct now is to try to figure out how the immune system regulates itself and make use of that information. Uh, you, you know, just, it doesn't take rocket science to, to realize that when you get an infection, you clear the infection and the immune system then has to sort of stand down, has to turn itself off. Otherwise we would all be revved up and have flu-like symptoms forever. Uh, sure. So the immune system has its own inbuilt uh, switches to turn itself off when the time is appropriate. And my whole sort of uh, shtick now <laughs> is to try to figure out uh, what those off switches are and how can we use them to really control the immune system, to turn it off at the appropriate times, uh, like in autoimmune diseases or in allergies or in oh, transplantation when you don't want the immune system to reject the organ, uh, or even in severe COVID, severe COVID night, uh, pneumonia when you don't want the immune system to clog up the lungs with inflammation. So this is a, a whole new way of thinking about the immune paradigm not, use, not thinking of jacking up the immune system to fight infection, but thinking of how do you turn down the immune system at will using fairly natural mechanisms, trying to mimic, again, the, the body's natural way of turning off the immune system and making that into something that can be manipulated. That's interesting that, because it seems like there are already a lot of therapies out there for particular things that are based in immunosuppressant um, thinking like mm -hmm. putting rash cream on for example sure. well your your choice of words is exactly right there the the immunosuppressant therapies have been around for a long time since the 1950s when steroids were first used right and and that is still the standard way of treating all these diseases is with immunosuppression and uh, my organization called the immune tolerance network was established to try to change that paradigm we want oh. to stop the idea of of suppressing the immune system and we want to uh, develop the idea of switching the immune system to its own normal regulatory mechanisms. Um, so we, we view immunosuppression as a bit of a sledgehammer approach where you're just yes. knocking down the immune And we don't want to knock it down. Uh, we, we want to actually keep a very healthy, robust, balanced immune system where the regulatory parts of the immune system are enhanced uh, as, as needed to suppress autoimmune type diseases or hyperimmune type diseases. It's, it's That's a, intriguing. I love the way that you, uh, you chose the word sledgehammer. That is how I often think about these things, particularly when, yeah. uh, well, as you know, I was raised in a natural health paradigm. So in that, uh, in natural health thinking, suppressing immune function often results in a bigger out uh, expression later. So if you put a rash sure. cream on of a, 
you know, not like treating poison oak, for example, but you know, something that's more um, frequent, like psoriasis, maybe. Um, it can end up expressing itself almost like a teenager rebelling, being like, don't tell me what not yeah. to do. Um, and so, you know, natural health paradigm often is looking at how do you address something at a, system a systemic health level. And this sounds similar, but different, because this is about flipping switches. Right. Yeah. I mean, we should, first of all, we should recognize that 50 years of 60 years of immunosuppression has actually done quite a lot of good. But, but my point was, and as you've just illustrated, uh, it's time to, to change that. It's time to get away from the, the sledgehammer approach of uh, where your first choices for everything is immunosuppression and, and try, to take, try to take advantage of what we now know and what we will know about the normal switches in the immune system to turn it off at, uh, at the appropriate time or to turn it down at the appropriate time. We actually know a lot about that now. There are, there are elements of the immune system whose primary function is to dampen down the immune system when it's no longer needed. And so what we're trying to do is really understand that, use that, make that part of the therapy, make some, in some cases make that the sole therapy. And it, I, I think all of us in the field think that this is very much feasible and that this uh, is definitely in our future. Yeah. It's not that immunosuppression is bad. Uh, it's just that it, the era of thinking that it was the only approach is hopefully you know, going away eventually. Yeah, sure. I mean, it seems to me like there's room for a lot of thinking uh, about things. I love the idea of subtler approaches because often, um, you know, rash cream's a kind of a boring example, of course, <laughs> because, you know, it's like nobody really likes to talk about rashes and rash cream. Um, but, you know, there's, that's a hel even that has been helpful to people. But if there are other ways to address um, histamine response, for example, um, then that seems interesting. Uh, I think of like um, seasonal allergies and how many people have been helped through sure. slow desensitization through allergy shots, or at least that's my, again, rudimentary yeah. understanding of probably a much well, more complicated therapy. One of our clinical therapy. trials uh, was the pivotal trial that demonstrated how to desensitize and tolerate infants to peanut allergy. It was hugely successful. It cha changed the world. Uh, the World Health Organization, as well as all of the professional societies like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Institute of Health, all of them issued new guidelines you know, based on our clinical trial that showed that it's possible to retrain the immune system in children if they're started on the therapies, uh, this desensitization therapy before the age of 11 months uh, of age. So it's, uh, you, we're definitely learning a little bit now that's a really simple example of uh, where age-dependent exposure in a regulated way retrained the immune system. A lot of our trials now are with diseases that are really uh, in adults and they're serious diseases. Uh, uh, systemic lupus, multiple sclerosis, type one diabetes. You know, uh, there's a, you can go on and on uh, about these. Uh, and, and at the moment, what we're, what we're doing as a general concept here, is trying to use some of the known therapies that can block or stop the immune system, but instead of uh, using those chronically, use them just short, very short term to sort of re, uh, give us a window of opportunity to try flipping these switches that we were talking about to, to uh, augment normal immune regulation. So it's a kind of a two-stage approach where we use a short term conventional type therapy, get the body more receptive to then manipulation of the immune system to be more uh, controlled and to be more regulated. Are you saying that like uh, someone who has lupus, for example, um, could potentially, you know, again, this is still, it sounds like in research and discovery phase, but it, it, reach a point where they don't have to be on medication for the rest of their life? That's the purpose of my network. That's our that's, that is our big goal. Uh, now we are doing clinical trials. We've d already mm -hmm. done a couple in, in lupus, for example. Right now we have 20 or 24, 25 uh, active clinical trials going on right now. Uh, lots and lots of patients have volunteered mm -hmm. to enroll in these things. 
uh, because it is a, a an obvious aspiration to get off of drugs. Uh, and so th in the lupus trials we've run so far, they have not been successful in getting people off of drugs. They have been able to uh, minimize the type of immunosuppression they're on and get uh, fairly, fairly uh, reasonable periods of rem remission. You know, they, people can go six months to eight months, 12 months without a flare, but they haven't successfully completely uh, gotten back to normal. So we still got quite a ways to go here uh, before we can declare success on that uh, for lupus. That's that's very intriguing. And it does seem to me uh, to be a total shift in the standard health paradigm um, where once you've got something like this is your life now, take yeah. this drug forever, which seems hugely unappealing. Right. As I, as I say, those the drugs that do that, that you take for life and that give you back your life, are have fundamentally improved health care. Uh, we, we really shouldn't, you know, ignore the fact that they've dramatically helped you know, uh, millions of people. Uh, but I think our, we are at a stage where we can envision getting away from that and instead uh, approaching the whole question of how do we reset the immune system and get people off of drugs altogether. Hmm. That's intriguing. Well, looking to the future, anything you want us to know? <laughs> uh, just don't be afraid of being a scientist. Yeah, if you're in your young, if you're in your young thirties, like I was at one point when it dawned on me that I could be a scientist, uh, I, I hope that some of you have a, a similar experience. Well, I super appreciate you taking time to answer all my questions uh, that I asked out loud, and. Um, <laughs> We can answer other questions on another day, but uh, thank you for taking time to share your thoughts on curiosity, flexibility, science, and the work that you do. Well, happy to be here, and I, I hope that uh, you, this uh, podcast series goes on and on and on. It's, I find it very interesting. Oh, cool. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's very cool to hear uh, uh, someone involved in, in research say that change is helpful, interesting, and worth pursuing. It's a living. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thanks. Take care. Hearing a man of science offer curiosity and flexibility as desirable qualities to have really excites me. In my work as a coach and consultant in communication, collaboration, and team dynamics, curiosity and flexibility have proven to be immensely valuable qualities to individuals and organizations in all kinds of fields. But I think we could all use a good dose of what Jerry encourages us to do here, which is have some excitement about change. Get excited about what's possible. Get excited about thinking differently. Get excited about building on the work that others have created or about having them build on the work that you've done. And if you are inspired to pursue scientific curiosity specifically, be sure to tell them the Change Podcast sent you. In the meantime, I, and I hope that you'll follow suit, plan to continue to grow my own scientific literacy and my understanding of how researchers in all areas of scientific inquiry approach the big questions of the world. This show comes to you from the Art of Change Skills for Life. Visit artofchange.com to explore how you might grow your communication, collaboration, and leadership skills through workshops, coaching, and more. Plus, then you get to work with me. Thank you for listening to the Change Podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing, rating, and giving your review of our show. I'm Aiden Nepop. I wish you the kind of experiments in life you're excited to tell stories about. <laughs>